this is kind of validation it's a kind of referendum for putin's policy uh, russian presidential election is not the election the way you see in other democracies for instance the beauty of election uh, in, a, in a democracy is when there is a possibility of regime change there is a possibility of change in the government uh, in the case of russia uh, it's almost certain that he is going to come to power and he is going to be the president again somehow the image is a very subjective question the russian thinks putin as architect and stabilizer as a strong and charismatic leader no side is actually following the international law neither the western side nor the russian side that's the reality today ukraine has also violated russia has done it western countries have done it so how, how do you see the international law which country which side is uh, following the international law the expansion of nato was not necessary in my perspective it became uh, this issue came partly because you know uh, the west decided to expand nato and make ukraine a part of nato so you know it's a very complex issue and uh, the international law has been kind of uh, sidelined and what is being played out is the real geopolitics hello and welcome to the forum for global studies latest podcast i am dr sandeep tripathi today we are going to discuss russian presidential election 2024 with india's top prominent voice foreign affairs commentator professor rajan kumar professor rajan kumar is an associate professor at the school of international studies jawaharlal nehru university new delhi he has taught various foreign university including university of kentucky and moscow state university russia he has authored so many books including important book uh, re emerging russia a structure and institutions and process so thank you so much sir for joining us our dear friends a russian presidential election is the russia's the fifth russia's the eighth presidential election since 1991 and putin is contesting the election for the fifth term he was elected in 2000 and really re-elected 2004 2012 18 and now 2024 but the question is 2024 is the same as 2000 obviously not many experts says that putin is bound to win there is no challenge but geopolitics has changed russian politics has changed and to discuss more on this topic we have with us professor rajan kumar so sir again welcome to you and uh, my first question to you how do you see 2024 russian presidential election does it pose a serious challenge to putin especially under the backdrop of russia ukraine war first second western sanction on russia and the third one the kind of image putin was you know taking forward since 2000 does does it have any serious challenge Uh, thank you sandeep for having me here and let me tell you that you know from russian perspective this is very important election uh, this is important election for several reasons but the most important is that the war is ongoing and uh, uh, this is the fifth term that he'll be elected he is very likely to be elected with a huge majority uh, so uh, you know people are saying that uh, this election is not important but from if if you see from russian perspective from putin's perspective so this is election is important because it kind of validates uh, putin's policies in russia so on the issue of war uh, we know that many of the people uh, are critical but but uh, in the in majority of the people also think that this war has been imposed on russia uh, by the west and by the nato uh, as a consequence today you see that a huge majority roughly 80 to 85% of the people uh, are in favor of uh, putin today um there are there is a small section uh, which uh, is not in favor of war and russia has lost quite a bit in terms of economy in terms of manpower uh, in the war but again uh, russia has projected this war as an existential crisis so uh, russia is saying that uh, if uh, this 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 war was inevitable uh, if this war had not happened uh, probably uh, nato would have occupied uh, you know no, nato would have come to ukraine and uh, ukraine means you know the crimea could have become the part of that nato uh, influence so as a consequence from russian perspective this is uh, extremely important and uh, you know in russia as far as uh, this is kind of validation it's a kind of referendum for putin's policy 
uh, Russian presidential election is not the election the way you see in other democracies. For instance, how many times have you seen uh, Putin going for a campaign or Putin engaging in presidential debate? Uh, you may not seen this. You may not have seen that kind of situation. So uh, this election is very important uh, for other reason uh, because you know uh, it kind of validates Putin's policy on uh, domestic policy and also uh, in Russia Ukraine uh, context. Uh, and uh, uh, it's not that there are not uh, opposition parties. There are several uh, parties which are contesting. But Putin very interestingly considers himself uh, to be above party politics. So he's not a member of any party. The most important party in Russia, as you know, uh, is the United Russia Party, which is the dominant party in Duma, which is the parliament of uh, Russia. But uh, United Russia Party, uh, again, uh, he supports United Russia Party, but he is not a member of the party. Uh, so that's the kind of you know distinction. That's the kind of uh, the, the difference that you need to understand. Uh, so there are uh, there, there are three other uh, contestants. One is from the Communist Party, uh, Kharitonov. Uh, he's the candidate. And there is also uh, one Liberal Democratic Party, uh, and you have uh, one more new uh, new, new, people, new People's new Party. People party. Uh, so there are a few parties contesting, but unfortunately they do not have independent voice. Uh, they do not have independent character. So, in my view, this election is uh, important for, for Putin's validation of uh, his policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia Ukraine war. Uh, coming to your second question of whether it's a challenge for Putin, uh, I think you know uh, it's not a challenge in the sense that uh, Putin is not facing any real challenge in terms of opposition parties. You know, uh, any uh, any uh, any of the members of the opposition party, they are not in position to uh, throw a challenge to uh, Putin in terms of uh, election. Uh, so, uh, as, as I said, Putin has a support of roughly 85 to 90 percent. So, uh, I don't think there is any chance of any other candidate coming even close to Putin. So, uh, so that way, you know, this election is important more for Putin than for Russia. Latin. Okay, sir. I agree with you, sir, that you, you know, stated that it, this election validates Putin's regime. But see, it's very interesting. Uh, if we look from the Indian perspective or the Western perspective, generally when elections takes place, so it's a kind of dance of democracy. People celebrate a kind of euphoria. And uh, from a state vendor to you know, top elite, all talking about the elections results. But we have seen in Russia, there is no kind of any dance of you know, euphoria, especially you know, the country is going for the election and there is no excitement among the youth. So, do you think that there is a systematic opposition? This you mentioned that the three parties contesting: Communist Party, Liberal Democratic Party, and New People's Party. And interestingly, all the candidates from the State Duma and they in, in the in the past they validated, they approved Putin's decision, especially Russian invasion of Ukraine. So, how do you think? Is it systematic or if Putin is sure to win, why is this election is going on? I think, you know, the beauty of election uh, in, a, in a democracy is when there is a possibility of regime change. There is a possibility of change in the government. Uh, in the case of Russia, uh, it's almost certain that he is going to come to power and he is going to be the president again. So that uncertainty, the uncertainty, that element that you have in any election, for instance, India's election or uh, United States election, mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, in, in those elections, there is always an element of uncertainty. You never know which, who is going to be the Prime Minister, President, etc. But in the case of Russia, that element of uncertainty is not there. So, it's very certain that, you know, he is going to uh, come to power. So, there is no systematic opposition. And systematic opposition, I mean, not just by the existence of political parties, but also in terms of, uh, you know, uh, if the media were independent, if uh, judiciary was uh, independent. Uh, so, uh, that is not the case. Uh, the, as you know that uh, parliament is dominated by Russian United Russia Party and United Russia Party is uh, supported by Putin. So parliament is controlled. Uh, the judicial process, uh, they are appointed by uh, most of the judges. They are they're appointed by the president. So judiciary is not independent. Uh, civil society, uh, you know, uh, is not uh, you know very powerful there. And uh, media is not independent, uh, especially the, you know, the electronic media. So that is controlled by the state. So because of that, Russia is not moving in the direction of uh, what do you say, a liberal democracy. And Russia does not claim to be moving towards. Russia has no qualms about move, not uh, moving towards that liberal democracy because they consider liberal democracy to be a different uh, kind of system which is not appropriate for Russia. Uh, so uh, what you have in Russia, that uh, in democracy, there are two types, as you know. One is uh, this electoral democracy and the second one is uh, substantial democracy. 
So you do have the facade of election, you do have the electoral processes taking place for everything in Russia. But as far as the substantial part of democratic deliberation is concerned, is, is concerned so that substantial part is missing in Russia. So there is no systematic opposition to Putin's uh, or his uh, regime uh, at, at the moment. Sir, how do you think uh, the Putin you know, is known as a stabilizer, system, a system builder? And we have seen since 2000, you know, he has taken forward the country at the highest level in terms of the power, in terms of the position that has lost in 1990s. So, do you think that in this election, we have seen a uh, Russian occupied in Ukraine citizen like Jeporozhia, um, you know, uh, <clears throat> in, uh, in Luhansk, Donetsk and Crimea, our elections are going there. So, do you think, is it a loyalty check for the Putin? Uh, I think, you know, ma, it, more than loyalty check, what I consider that uh, since Putin has uh, kind of incorporated, that's what Russian call it. Uh, they don't say they invaded or they kind of colonized. They say they reintegrated, reincorporated. So, ma, in a way, uh, because, you know, uh, the, the areas which have been uh, kind of, you know, incorporated in uh, within the territory of Russia, so those areas are dominated by Russian population, Russian minority population. And uh, in that, those areas, the Russians are dominant, not the Ukrainian population. Ukrainians are also there, Polish population is also there, but they are in minority in, in the area that have been occupied by Russia. Uh, so uh, in, in the election is taking place in that area also. So, uh, and it's very likely that, you know, a pro-Putin party will come to power there also. Or they will uh, kind of support Putin uh, and there is no systematic opposition. To that so loyalty wise yes uh, they will definitely support uh, russia uh, russia means they'll definitely support putin uh, and uh, and uh, it, it, as i said it, it's a kind of referendum of uh, putin's policy it's a kind of uh, uh, validation and legitimation of uh, putin's uh, policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis ukraine and uh, the west will not accept it the west uh, does not recognize anyway uh, putin is considered a pariah today uh, putin is not a part of the any deliberation with the west at the moment and uh, as, as I can see, the war is escalating at, from Ukrainian side and also from Russian side. And there is no possibility of ceasefire. So in that context, I think, you know, the policies will continue. And uh, yes, you can say that it's a kind of uh, loyalty, but more than loyalty is a kind of validation of the policies of integration. Okay, sir. Yeah. Sir, as an expert on Russia, last 25 years, around 25 years, you have experience. Now you have been speaking on Russian politics. So today our world is grappling the two institutional norms. First is uh, collective West led by the US always, you know, I uh, always blame on Russia that Russia has you know, annexed this illegal territory and Putin's its own justification on you know Ukraine's territory, like uh, the Eastern Ukraine, just because of this civilizational link, this ethnicity, proximity, and you know, uh, linguistic proximity, all that. As experts, sir, just we want to know your insights. What exactly is right? The question is right because in international politics, it's very tough to uh, to figure out the positions of Russia and the positions of West. West is the violation of norms of international law, and Russia says it has somehow the protection of Russian interest. To these two kinds of grappling, the, the world is grappling the two norms. How do you see? It? I think, you know, the tussle that you see, Sandeep, uh, in today's context, the tussle is between uh, the international law and norms, the way uh, they're defined by the United Nations and the, and the real politic, uh, the, the real geopolitics, where NATO is trying to expand, you know, European Union is trying to uh, incorporate Ukraine in some way. So the real politics is coming in contest with the, 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 the liberal uh, normative values that you are talking about. So uh, if I go by the strict uh, definition of international law, so the territorial uh, territorial integrity of a state should not be violated. When Ukraine became independent, Russia accepted that. You know, I'm talking about 1991, this Velezhov well Accord, where uh, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, uh, they were the countries which basically decided that that uh, Russia, uh, that Soviet Union should disintegrate. Uh, so after that, you know, once you accept it, uh, legally, uh, strictly legally speaking, from international law perspective, so territorial violation of a country cannot be supported. But uh, the problem is that, you know, when it comes to geopolitics, so Russia, with, uh, Russia also says, and it has valid point that uh, there was an agreement which also said that NATO will not expand. Yeah. 
So if NATO started expanding and uh, and uh, the understanding was that you know uh, Ukraine will not become a member of the NATO. So if uh, the if international norm is uh, kind of you know coming in clash with the real geopolitics, a real uh, balance of power, balance of politics, real politics, what do you call it? So uh, always you will see that powerful countries have uh, kind of you know Trump, uh, powerful countries have violated the international norms. They have not been uh, contained by the values of international law and they go by the national interest. And what Russia is doing today, Russia claims that it has a historical link with Ukraine and that's, there, is a, there is a fact there because the Russian civilization emerged from uh, Kiev. And uh, these, these are the Slavic nations, Ukraine, Belarus and Russia. These are the proper Slavic, the, the core of the Slavic uh, nations. Uh, so in that context, you know, uh, that uh, these territories are important for Russia. And Crimea, as you know, Crimea was always uh, this nuclear fleet of Russia is there. And Russia would never allow the Black Sea uh, to become uh, the, the kind of, you know, the Black Sea fleet or, or in Crimea to become the part of uh, this uh, NATO and Ukraine. Mm -hmm. So, you know, uh, it's, it's a very complex issue and uh, it's very difficult. It's, it's easy to blame one side. But the reality is somewhere is very complex and is very difficult to uh, to say. So no side is actually following the international law. It, neither the Western side nor the Russian side. That's the reality today, and uh, uh, and the world is moving much more uh, you know towards a system which is multipolar. Multiple norms are uh, you know being defined. So in that context, we need to uh, you know uh, we need to see that uh, Ukraine has also violated. Russia has done it. Western countries have done it. So how, how do you see the international law? Which country, which side is uh, following the international law? Ukrainian elections should have taken place. That is not taking place. Ukrainian law, you know, against the Russian minority, the kind of laws which were passed, that, that should not have been passed. The NATO expansion was not necessary. I don't, uh, you know, from Indian perspective, I do not see that Russia was, Russia was posing a threat to the Western country. So expansion of NATO was not necessary in my perspective. It became, uh, this issue came partly because, you know, uh, the West decided to expand NATO and make Ukraine a part of NATO. So, you know, it's a very complex issue and uh, the international law has been kind of uh, sidelined and what is being played out is the real geopolitics. So, during this crisis we have seen, and I would like to mention Putin's statement, uh, Putin stated Russia is not at the crossroad. And this election will justify Putin's movement, yeah, Putin's action. Uh, this election will certainly put a stamp on Putin's policy without any doubt. This will validate, legitimate uh, this uh, Putin's policy. Uh, but, you know, uh, as far as Russia is concerned, you know, Russia is a very mysterious country. Uh, and as Winston Churchill said, and you know that very well, so uh, uh, Russia is a riddle wrapped in a mystery inside an enigma. So it's very difficult to understand uh, Russia. And if you want to understand Russia, so you have to understand through the national interest of Russia. So, uh, uh, in, as far as foreign policy and national interest, the way it is being defined today, the Western countries, they sought to kind of isolate Russia, but somehow uh, Russia has not been isolated. As you, as you see that uh, the countries of the global south, a large number of countries today, uh, they are still with uh, Russia. For instance, India refused to be the part of uh, the sanction regime. And India said for very right reason that uh, when, you dis when you were deciding about the sanction, uh, did you take us into account? Did you call us for the, uh, when the decision was being taken? No. So, you know, the, the, the policy of the West thinking that all the global South will follow just because you have taken the decision, I think those days are over. And uh, uh, the countries of the global South, be it South Africa, India, Brazil, China, whatever you call it. So, these countries are not uh, following the proper, the Western policies, the way, you know, and the Western countries are not in position to impose uh, or impose their, uh, their, their laws on, impose their decisions on the countries of the global south and global south southern countries today have become very important you have seen BRICS, you have seen the kind of role they are playing in the g20 etc so in that context russia putin has succeeded in two three ways first russia has not been defeated so people think that putin is playing an important role uh, russia has not been kind of uh, russia has not been kind of crippled despite the western sanctions maximum sanctions uh, so russia has not been crippled so people think that economy is doing uh, okay it's not doing great but again it's doing okay uh, so that has that has gone in favor of uh, Russia. The fact that global southern countries they refuse to go with the West and they refuse to take side rather, uh, so that has also gone in favor of uh, Putin. And Putin can claim today, and as he does in all the meetings, that uh, Russia has not been isolated. Uh, so yes, uh, uh, Russia has been cut off from the Western countries. That's a fact. And even today, uh, Russia identifies. Let me tell you, 
uh, with, uh, with the West in many ways. Although it calls uh, itself a Eurasianist state and Eurasianism under Putin became very prominent as a state philosophy, a state nationalism, etc. But uh, Russia is very closely linked with the West in several ways. Uh, ideologically, in terms of religion, in terms of culture, it, it is much more closer to the West than it is to India or Russia, India, India or China. So, uh, but, so but Russia has been cut off from the West and that's not a good thing in terms of technology, in terms of ideas, religion, uh, culture, etc. But at the same time, uh, what we are seeing is a new kind of world order which is emerging. Uh, China is, as you know, is uh, emerging as the most powerful uh, country. Uh, so, uh, India gradually, as you see with the growth rate being projected, so India is emerging as a, as a pole in itself. Uh, so India is important uh, that way. And Russia's relation with both the countries, China as well as India, is a very uh, delicate balance, but uh, China, uh, Russia has done very well. And, uh, and I don't think, I, I don't see that, you know, India's policy will change in the coming years uh, vis a vis Russia. And uh, uh, Foreign Minister has made several statements where he has said that Russia is the only country which has never hurt the interest of India. And Indian believe in that. So that's the reason, you know, uh, India is very pro uh, Russia in, in many ways. Although India's policy is, uh, India does not support the violation of uh, territorial integrity of any state. So on that issue, uh, India is careful. But uh, otherwise, uh, India does not blame or India has never condemned Russia. Uh, officially, uh, I mean, it, it has never condemned Russia or Putin. Wonderful insight, sir. Uh, you rightly pointed out that India, India's foreign uh, affairs minister so many times made this statement that India is entitled to have its own voice, especially on Russia's stand. So the last question sir, to you, and uh, I hope that audience will understand and will be benefited from this point. Uh, the kind of uh, you know deep insights are coming from Professor Rajan sir. So this last point sir, uh, Putin uh, after Stalin, he's the one second one is going to for this longest uh, regime, and this election you no know, will validate his regime thirty. And after the 30, then 36. So I think, uh, you know, since uh, Russian Revolution until now, uh, he will also cross this kind of limitation, this kind of exception of uh, Stalin. So this coming years is going to be very crucial for the best, and it is going a very beneficial for India. How do you see? I think uh, no, but India has adopted a very smart policy. Let me tell you by not taking uh, the side. Uh, India has refused to take a side and uh, India is thinking that you know uh, this is a European war all right and uh, you are not when NATO is expanding you do not ask us when Russia decided to invade uh, Russia didn't bother to inform uh, India uh, so uh, so why should we take the side all right uh, uh, so uh, and uh, in many cases for instance you know on the issue of Kashmir on the issue of number thing Western countries have been uh, fairly critical to India on the nuclear issue also although India has a very good relation with the United States today and uh, with a number of Western countries also, we have very strong economic and technological and political ties. Uh, but uh, India's policy is of a kind of multi-alignment. Multi-alignment, which means that if India's national interest goes with uh, the Western countries, it is willing to assign, uh, be a member of Quad, have a very strong partnership with the United States, UK and Western countries. But at the same time, uh, on uh, certain issues, you know, we converse, our interest converse with Russia. Uh, for instance, on the issue of you know uh, arms import, on the issue of con continental politics in Eurasia, uh, on the issue of balancing China, uh, on the issue of you know uh, balancing uh, uh, you know Iran, etc. So for that reason, Russia is very important, and Russia is uh, we are one of the uh, biggest importers of arms from Russia. So for a number of reasons, uh, um, you know uh, we consider Russia to be important, and also remember that most of the threats uh, to India are continental threats, not the maritime threats. Uh, coming either from China or from Pakistan side. So in that context, you know, uh, we cannot allow a situation to emerge where Russia, China and Pakistan, uh, they, uh, they become a kind of, you know, a partner and uh, India is isolated. So we do not allow the 19th century kind of situation to emerge and great power politics the way uh, we saw in 19th century. So uh, India is very careful and India will not allow that kind of situation to emerge. And, you know, uh, whenever you make an alliance, uh, there are two kind of uh, commitments. Uh, one, and, and one is commitment, other one is fear. So there is a fear of abandonment. So you fear that if you, India thinks that if uh, it goes all out with the West, uh, if it is abandoned by the West, then it is nowhere, right? So the fear of abandonment is there. Uh, and also uh, the second is uh, the fear of entrapment. 
uh, for instance, you know, uh, the, the rivalry between the United States and, Ch and China is kind of uh, escalating in Taiwan Strait and in uh, economic field also. So India fears that uh, India would be entrapped in the Western conflict uh, with China uh, uh, somewhere. So India is careful, you know, India's, India's foreign policy at the moment is very delicate, very careful, where it is saying that we are willing to have a political alliance, but we are not going for military alliance with any country, either with the United States or with Russia. Uh, and uh, we are not playing one against the other. So we are not with Russia against the West. Similarly, we are not with the West against Russia. So, so, and that understanding is there with China also, with, with, with Russia also, in the sense that uh, Russia is very close to China, but Russia-China alliance is not working against India. So that understanding between India and Russia is there, and that defines uh, India's foreign policy in the broader uh, geopolitical context. And I see a very uh, uh, kind of the, the uh, India's relationship with Russia will continue very strong. Uh, economically, India will be much more diverse in, because India is growing economically, so its uh, footprint will increase globally. Uh, India, our trade with Russia cannot increase that much. Uh, but again, uh, for security reasons, for uh, defense reasons, Russia will remain an important player. And also for the, uh, the geopolitical security that I said just now. Sir, uh, there is no doubt that Putin is going to win this election and he will remain to 2030. How do you think that uh, Putin's image after the Russian uh, Ukraine war, we have seen the image, uh, the stabilizer, you no know, image, a kind of strong leader, it has been dented externally, internally. How do you think that uh, uh, that uh, Russian bother about the image? I think, you know, Putin, uh, the strong leader image, uh, and you have worked on that. So I know my, you, your leadership uh, this thing, you have worked to your PhD on that. So Putin became a very popular and a strong leader uh, because of two, three reasons. Uh, you know, Russia, people started thinking in 1990s that Russia might disintegrate further after the second uh, Soviet disintegration. So there was a sense that, you know, Russia might, because Chechnya, there was an issue in Chechnya, there was an issue in Siberia, uh, there was an issue in Ishugetia, issue, issue etc. So, you know, uh, Putin kind of created a kind of stable Russia. So he uh, he kind of he suppressed the rebellion in Chechnya that you know. Uh, later on also he intervened in Georgia, and uh, uh, and second factor that contributed to Putin's popularity was economic growth. So from if you see the 2000 to 2008 period, so the economy started growing very fast, and the loans etc that Russia has taken from the IMF etc it paid much before the time. So the growth uh, 8 percent, 7 percent, 9 percent. So that growth of uh, early years in uh, from 2000 to 2008. So that created a very positive image uh, of Putin. And finally, uh, uh, he also, you know, the oligarchs, some of the oligarchs were very powerful. And these oligarchs, unfortunately, they are the popular leaders in the West, but they are hated in Russia. Uh, because, you know, uh, from, in, from the Soviet period, when you had no capital, suddenly, how do you become a billionaire? So people started questioning that kind of, you know, policy, which led to the rise of such billionaires. So he controlled those billionaires, and especially the billionaires which were politically ambitious. So he put a curve on that and people in Russia supported that kind of policy. So because of these and military reforms, agriculture reforms, etc. So because of these reasons, uh, Putin became a very strong and popular leader uh, in Russia. Uh, and in the, in, if I tell you the global southern uh, perspective, uh, not from Russian perspective, but the global south perspective. Uh, so Putin was uh, popular in many countries in global south, partly because he stood against the West. So uh, people thought, because you know people are not experts, so people thought that is taking a stand against the West and anti-Western sentiment is uh, very uh, prevalent, very much prevalent in the global southern country also. Uh, so uh, because of that, he was popular. But now, uh, what after you know this Ukrainian uh, this uh, uh, capture of territory, uh, some of the people uh, have turned critical in the global South also because they think that territorial integration, uh, when you have accepted the territorial integrity of Ukraine uh, in uh, 1991. So uh, Russia should not have violated that, all right. So, so some of the people, especially coming from the liberal background in the global south, they uh, they will not criticize official policy of India or uh, South Africa or Brazil. Uh, they will never condemn Russia. But if you talk to the people, many of the people think that what Russia did uh, uh, against the smaller neighbor, so probably that would be uh, considered illegal in terms of international law. So as a consequence, some of the people have turned uh, definitely critical in the global south uh, about the West. Uh, the Western, for the Western countries, majority of the majority, majority of the people there and the majority of the leaders there and political parties there, they consider Putin to be a demon. Uh, you know, uh, they consider Putin to be a villain. They consider Putin, which is again one-sided perspective. 
so uh, so Putin Putin is not worried about his image uh, internationally, but he is definitely worried about his image domestically. Uh, but his domestic image has not dented. And as far as you know, uh, some of the Western media are saying that he'll continue till 2036, etc. So it's very difficult to say. And Russian politics changes very fast, and we you know that how many times constitutions have been changed in Russia in the last uh, 70 years or so. So politics in Russia changes very fast. At the moment, yes, Putin is in control of power. But what happens after 2030 is very difficult to say in the context of Russia. So I'll stop it here. Thank you so much. Uh, very you know important insights, uh, especially on Putin's image because. Always we you know learn this, we heard this question, the image and image. And somehow the image is a very subjective question. With the Russians thinks Putin as architect, as stabilizer, as a strong and charismatic leader, and that's why uninterrupted, unquestionable authority, and there is no question on Putin's legitimacy. So no matter, no bother about the Western's narratives on Putin's image. But at the same time, the global south. A countries from the global south, they have a little bit of positive sentiment because a person who is going to challenge the Western dominance, the Western has the money over the international order. So thank you so much, sir, for this podcast. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. Thank you for having me here.